Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. My last guest this week is Michael Wellham. He is a former Royal Marines commando with 40 years of practical diving experience and is here to talk uh, through the history of combat divers, uh, all coinciding with the release of his new book, Combat Diver, which will hold up there, but it's the same color as the green screen. So if it looks like it's got a hole in it, it's because it's the same color as the screen behind me. But yeah, Combat Divers, packed with photos. And it takes the story right the way from the beginning of Navy diving right up to the current day. So um, if you are new to the channel, don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget all the information you need, including the links to the book, are in the description below. But without further ado, I'll bring Michael in. So good evening, sir. How are you today? Yeah, good evening, Paul. I'm fine. Yes. So we were just talking before going live. You did a book about divers in 1989, so 30 plus years ago. So... This is a, a field or a, a sea, really, uh, is the better arena to describe what's going on, that is still in development. Things are still changing. So in those 30 years, that, that is, that's why you've come back to the subject. Yeah, uh, it was 18, 1989. It was a bit before that, obviously, with gathering uh, information. Uh, I was asked to do that book. Uh, and some of the people that uh, have joined the Navy and are now retiring uh, read that book, uh, and that's what inspired them to become divers. Uh, it was called Combat Frogman on that. So for this one, uh, which has been put uh, together by Osprey, uh, is uh, changed the name to uh, Combat Divers, which is the same thing. Right. And that, well, as we will probably get to later on the show, we when we do shows about special forces on World War II TV, some of the, the forms of going into combat in World War II just don't really exist anymore. I mean, there are still paratroopers around the world, but the, the use of paratroopers as mass divisions jumping in behind the lines probably won't happen anymore, or if it will, it will be indifferent to, to how it was in the past. But diving is one of those special forces areas that is still ongoing. We can't perceive of there being a future without it. So that's what makes it very interesting. We are going to cover the World War II history, but we're going to bring it right up to date as well. So folks, Michael has come with PowerPoint. I'm in charge today. He'll tell me when to move on the slide. But if you okay. have questions, please fire away with them as we go along. But over to you, Mike. We have the first slide, please. Yep, we are. Yep. No, the second one, sorry. Yeah, sorry, that's there it. We go. Uh, right back in the beginning, uh, before the uh, Second World War in the 1930s, uh, the diving in the Navy and, and the military was with standard gear, big, heavy gear. Uh, you see it in museums. Uh, there are working groups that show it and display it. But it's quite heavy, clumbersome, uh, very good to use uh, in the water but you've got to have people on the surface getting air down to you and you can't swim around anywhere you walk around. So it's very, very restricted in many senses. Uh, the Italian, or the uh, uh, chap called uh, C.B. Gorman uh, in the UK, he developed one and that's the picture of it there, the Amphibian Mark I. Uh, it's a closed circuit breathing system, which means that you put... Uh, your oxygen from the cylinders that you carry on the side into a bag uh, and then you breathe in and it brings the oxygen out. Then you breathe back out again and it puts it through a filter system to remove the carbon dioxide and it just goes round and round so no bubbles are given off. Uh, he went to the Royal Navy and they said, oh, no, no, we don't have anything. We've got standard gear. That's all we need. So he went to, uh, to Italy uh, and ended up uh, going down there and building a factory and producing it. So that was the very sort of the beginning of this system. Uh, in the uh, Royal Navy, if we go to slide number two, uh, you've got on the left, that's the heavy standard gear. Uh, as you can see, it, you know, it's quite heavy, quite cumbersome. You climb in and out of the water. Uh, but the only thing the, uh, the British had uh, was on the right side there, and it's the Davis submarine, submerged escape apparatus. <clears throat> so that works on the same principle. You pump uh, some oxygen into the bag, uh, and breathe in, and then when you breathe out, it goes through a filter, it cleans it all out, and then you can carry on until you run out of oxygen in your bottle. So that's the, the two types of setup that there were. Now, the DSE was a bit... Uh, Clumbersome, uh, but it was all there was. And I say it was designed for, for submarines. Uh, 
So, so in those early days, Mike, um, were divers suggesting to the Royal Navy what could be done with diving, or was the Royal Navy telling divers and people who are involved in the technology what they wanted from divers, or was it kind of a combination of the meeting of both? Well, the, the, the Royal Navy set out what it required divers to do, and that was generally work uh, on the side and under warships. So it was quite easy to have a cage and you could lower the guys down into the water and they can move about uh, and control themselves down there. Uh, they put ropes right under the ship so they can move about. Uh, very time consuming, very cumbersome. Uh, whilst the uh, we didn't realise at the time that we needed to be more flexible. And that comes on to the next slide, please. There we go. Yeah, with, with this one, it's... Uh, uh, a human torpedo, uh, a chariot, as they were called, and it was developed by the Italians. Uh, and, uh, the first attacks, oh, if, if I can go back, Gibraltar was the main staging port for uh, Allied shipping getting stuff into North Africa. That was critical. Ships would go there, they could refuel and await for a slot so that they could take the stuff across to North Africa and offload it. Uh, the Italians realised that, wow, that's their very valuable targets there. They developed this uh, human torpedo uh, and you could uh, whiz across uh, to uh, um, to Gibraltar and they managed to get down there, go in maybe two or three of these human torpedoes and you drive it under the uh, under the ship and you can leave an explosive charge. It's the warhead on the front. Uh, they were very effective. In Right in the very beginning, they were effective. Nobody expected them. So ships were at anchor just off of Gibraltar. The Italians came in underwater. They drove their craft underneath. And you put a wire on one side of the ship. Uh, and on the bilge kill, and then another, the wire over to the other side on the bilge kill, <coughs> and then you release the warhead. So the warhead then is hanging underneath the ship, unseen by anybody and unknown, uh, and then at the top, the clock ticks round, uh, and then it will go off once these guys have got away. So that was how they the schedules, and they were effective. They were sinking ships, and a lot of them. That caused a lot of panic, uh, and as a result of that, uh, they set up a, an underwater working party in Gibraltar, and that consisted to start off with with two men, uh, an officer and a rating. Uh, they looked around for equipment, and the only equipment they had was the uh, uh, submarine escape equipment. That's the only stuff they could find. These people were very effective. Now, that's me on the right in uh, many years ago now. Uh, and that's Sid Knowles. Sid Knowles was around for a long time, and I spent many hours talking to him. He was in Gibraltar going under merchant ships and hauling mines off the bottom, which could have gone off at any time. So it was really dangerous job. And the guy that took over uh, and ran it through was uh, Commander. Uh, crab uh, as you can see he got the george medal obe uh, he took charge of gibraltar for the diving and eventually he and sid Knowles moved to italy because they overcame the uh, attacks that were going on sid was very valuable uh, when we looked at the gamma groups uh, these were the brought in later they were italian swimmers and they were located in gibraltar and they swam across and stuck limpet mines on the ships uh, and then just swam back. And then they could watch from Spain uh, the ships being blown up uh, for their work. OK, if we can have the next slide. Uh, and just, I've got a couple of questions we'll deal with yep. before, like, before we, we get too far on. So I'll go, I'll go back a couple of slides to the, um, to the picture. So Amnook is asking, how did the DSEA compare with the U.S. Navy Mon Momsen lung for submariners? Absolutely no idea. Okay, there we are. That, that's easy to do. Um, Sorry but about that. <laughs> no problem. And it, going back to this kind of this Mediterranean story, then the Gibraltar. It seems to me, and this is a lot of my knowledge is from movies and things, is that 
unlike some of the other technologies in World War II, perhaps, you know, paratroopers or long range reconnaissance or things like that, because of the small numbers of people comparatively involved, in, comparatively involved in this, both sides are actively watching what the other side's doing. And it's very, very much a trade off and, and, and a kind of competition between the two, almost immediate reactions to what the other, you know, the towns and the British are doing. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. We fortunately, we, we uh, on our side anyway, we had the right people in the right places with the right temperament and, uh, you know, a, a, a way to process it. But they, they had struggles. Uh, senior levels in the military still thought that you could send standard divers down, uh, but they just overcame that. You know, uh, in many ways, uh, when you look into their background, some of these guys were quite stroppy. Uh, and that's how they got things done. Uh, and where and, did they find the people? Because, you know, when we've done shows in the past about the SAS and the other yeah. uh, other early special forces, people like Damien Lewis, it was a lot of an old boys networks. One person knew someone else because, you know, there can't have been that many people in the British Isles who had experience of, of, of diving. Uh, so, so was it a question of kind of people knowing each other from pre-war or how, how did they find people who, were, who were, would be good at this? Okay, in in Crab's case, uh, he uh, qualified as a bomb and mine disposal officer in the UK. Right. And he was sent to uh, Gibraltar as the bomb and mine warfare disposal officer for, for that area. When he got there, he was told about the problems with the mines going on the ships. He went down to see the thinking there was a whole big team of people to find there was just two. <laughs> he took it upon himself to say, think that, well, I should be doing that because I'm the one that's going to be dealing with them and, de you know, making deactivating them. Uh, so they gave him the, the equipment, uh, dressed him up in the kit. He climbed down a ladder, to, stood on the bottom, moved around a bit, Climb back out again. He was now a qualified mine clearance diver. <laughs> uh, wow. And when he built the team up, they put uh, notices out for uh, special duties. Well, special duties, special hazardous, hazardous duties could be anything. Could be anything, yeah. Uh, so they put the notice out and people would go along and he, he would then interview them. And he just had this uncanny knack of knowing who was going to be okay and who was just by talking to them. Uh, and then as soon as they were accepted, they went along, climbed down the ladder with the gear on. Uh, and next thing they're under a ship out in the, in the bay, uh, searching the bottom of it. Which, which brings us nicely, nicely to this photo. So um, there you are back to you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, on, on this one, it's a member of the underwater par uh, working party. Now, when the Italians came over uh, in their attacks, they had rubber suits. They was completely sealed in rubber suits. <coughs> Excuse me. And they had uh, undergarments on for help keep them warm. Uh, they had fins on their feet to help them move in the water, obviously goggles. And they had this ver these very neat uh, closed circuit breathing system. We had nothing, uh, and so the teams went out there in the initial stages, and that's how they were dressed. Winter and summer, uh, a pair of swimming trunks, the uh, diving equipment on the front, and plimsolls, and a little pair of goggles. Uh, the plimsolls were weighted, so it kept their legs down, uh, and that's how they moved around, uh, sort of swimming, if, as it were, rather than finning. Uh, and they would come in due course, but that's how these guys dived. And it was 52 weeks of the year, 365 days of the year. They were out there uh, working, looking under ships and looking for those sorts of mines stuck on the ship, which they then removed. I mean, it's, it stands to reason. It's, it's multitasking. You've got to be good at lots of different things to do this. You've got to be good underwater. You've got to be able to withstand the temperature and the cold and just that physicality of it and you've also got to be up to date on 
technology of, of the ever in changing mines and technology and fuses and ship designs. things. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of work in this. How, how was the information being assimilated to, to provide these teams with up to date information? I mean, obviously, they I suppose they're getting the information themselves when they find some new mine or something new. They're the ones f first to, to discover it, I suppose. Yep, they go down there and they find it. So like with that limpet, uh, you've got to try it because it's held on with magnets. You've got to try and lever that off and let it fall to the seabed so it would be harmless down there. Uh, and that's the way they do it. And they just levered it off. And when they come up, they said, oh, I found three mines and I managed to lever three off. Oh, that's good. And it was, you know, one of the questions that Crab would ask, you know, what's your swimming like? Well, he was a terrible swimmer. <laughs> Uh, but he, he was one of these people that are quite happy when he gets underwater. And many divers are uh, like that. You know, they, they might not be super good, you know, in a swimming pool, swimming up and down, but they're just brilliant underwater. Wow. Uh, and that's how these guys were. And it was, it was high risk. They didn't know when that was going to go bang. And, of course, later on in the war, they would put devices on the mines that if you – tried to lever it off it would go bang anyway so you know anti anti-mine devices so there was a, you know it's a it was a moving feast and you learnt as you went along and you learnt from the people you were with and i'm guessing you know you in your career that by the time you start diving with the with with the navy there is at least now a backlog of data. There was 30 years 40 years whatever it was of information of here's how we used to do it. These guys Crab and his teams are kind of writing the history as they go. <laughs> they're, they're starting with this with this yeah. concept, and they're kind of filling it in as they go along. So pioneers seems to be the appropriate word to describe these. And of course, their their fellows in the Italian uh, navy, their their enemy, but also pushing this this technology on. Uh, it, it's it really is incredible. But we'll move on to the next image, and you can run us through the various uh, teams yeah. and duties and, and and objectives. Of course. Once they got Gibraltar and the and the Italian bit sort of under control uh, and people were trained up there, uh, back in the UK, uh, we, of course, we had the uh, underwater working party in Gibraltar, Italy. They then set up the combined operation pilotage parties, uh, you know, and they had specific functions to do. Uh, and that was looking at beaches and uh, looking in the ports when they were going to be captured and, and clearing mines anywhere they were. The Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment, as it was called then, they were never given diving titles because, you know, if the Germans got hold of it, they wouldn't understand perhaps what they were. So it was all part of the cover-up. Uh, you had the uh, Royal Marines, I say, uh, unit there, uh, and that was the precursor to the special boat service that we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, and they moved around in canoes uh, and uh, and also just free swimming as well. Uh, Crab managed to get hold of a human torpedo uh, from the Italians uh, in Gibraltar. That was sent back. So then we had our own uh, uh, human torpedo unit. We designed and built our own. And they went off to do uh, attacks on uh, any large ships that they could get access to. Also in the mix was the Special Operations Executive, SOE, uh, because they needed to get people in behind enemy lines, covert beach uh, infiltration, exfiltration. Uh, and so they also uh, <laughs> tried to train people, or they did train people, uh, and it was all it was all very hit and miss. There wasn't sort of a centralised training programme. People went off and did their own things. Uh and then there was the Admiralty Experimental Diving Unit because they were experimenting then on diving tables. If you uh, if you take all of most of these systems at a closed circuit were oxygen. Oxygen, uh, you can't use that below 10 metres. It, it becomes toxic. Uh, although people have dived deeper than that, I, I do admit. But uh, that's the, the, the rule. That's the levelling off. So they wanted to know how far you could go. So they got volunteers to go in, pressured them up to all sorts of depths to see whether they survived uh, and, and what the uh, impact was on it. Uh, so 
that was that was from that side and you can see the diving suits <clears throat> uh the one on the left there uh i think that one was uh, the dunlop it's in two two parts you put the top part on it goes draws over your head uh and then the bottom part goes on the bottom part there uh, and then you fold the two together they overlap fold them and then you put a rubber band which you can just see mm. and that steals that joint uh, more modern suits of course they've got zips and yeah. uh, it, it's a one piece and then you have the uh, you have a put a ring around your neck and then the hood fits over the top so it's all well sealed and then your mask fits on the front of it and there's a picture of one uh, person in there uh with a, a closed circuit set, again, uh, experimental, uh, looking at the suits and the breathing apparatus and what you can and can't do, duration, breathing rates, so the whole uh, gambit of things that they were, were looking for. And so two points I want to make there. One is uh, just a, a, a frame of reference is that how many times, if we were to be able to draw a family tree of special forces in 41, 42, 43. They all kind of have these connections. I mean, SOE comes up and everything. The SBS is getting get connected to the SAS, and there's a small scale raiding force. Now there's what you're talking about here. It's amazing how at, there's that period in the middle of the war where everything is connected. And then when they kind of find their purpose, they start becoming separate organizations. But there's this point where it's like everything's connected. That's my first observation. And my second is, when we're talking about experimental diving, you're talking about going down to different depths, things like that. Is there is is there a medical uh, staff involved in this assessing what happens to human beings? Are people coming back ill? Are, are, is anybody uh, being lost, uh, killed in any of these things? How, how are they monitoring what humans can do? Because, again, I'm, I'm pointing out the fact this is still a fairly new technology. It, it was very controlled. Uh, they had a setup with chambers. And uh, there were medical staff in there who oversaw it and plotted everything and everything was recorded and analyzed. Uh, so it, it was controlled. It was just that it was new. People mm. hadn't done it before. Uh, so it was a big learning curve because once you've got a, a system that works of diving tables that work, you know, you can then extend on that or subtract or you can modify them. These guys had to create that in the first place. And that's a good point, actually. You mentioned you know, talking about tables there. In the, and I'm going to reference parachuting because with parachuting, there's so many variables that, that can affect a good parachute jump. Weather, wind speed, aircraft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, altitude. With diving, is it very much that physics follows rules? So once you've established what happens at certain depths, is that kind of consistent? And then it just the, the different types of diving gear affect the 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 the, the the specifics of it is there kind of a very rigid set of rules of what does and doesn't work well at that time i suppose the, the rigid rule became the 10 meter rule right you know you're breathing oxygen you don't go down below that once you go below that you start mixing your gases and then that becomes a whole new uh, which is what happens today but at the time there they really didn't want to go much below the bottom of a ship you know it, in 10 meters 30 feet you know you you can swim in underwater you you can get to most things you don't really need to go deeper okay the only thing is it's uh, it's knowing what depth you're at so you know there were all the depth gauges had to be uh developed and uh, made available across all the force wow so we're moving on next slide yeah <laughs> <clears throat> on this one, uh, you can see the, that the uh, top left is the British uh, human torpedo. Um, we had people uh, uh, going out doing a number of raids. We talk about those in the book. Um, the guy in the middle, he's sitting at the uh, at the control. So they had a little seat there and they could control the, uh, the, the craft up and down and whichever way they wanted to go. And on the right, there's the suit that was developed for that, um, the uh, Sladen suit, uh, and the helmet is it's all part of the, the setup, and you just have that little flap that lets you uh, breathe air when you when you're on the surface, and then you're down to the the uh, bag with the oxygen and the uh, and the breathing. Uh, they had a nickname for that; they called it Clammy Death uh i've never experienced it 
but a lot of this stuff, if anybody is interested in this, you can actually go and see a lot of this stuff at the uh, D Diving Museum in Portsmouth. Yep, it there's came up in the sidebar. It was mentioned earlier, and we put it. Yeah, yeah so it's it, a super, it, there's a superb uh, diving museum, uh, and they've got a, tons of stuff all the way through history, and they keep adding to it. So anybody that is interested and wants to see it and see what it's like, that's the place to go. And then, of course, we had the uh, the X-Craft, uh, the midget submarines. Uh, we built those, uh, a crew of four, uh, and one of those would be a diver. Uh, and he could uh, exit or get back in again, um, and they would go in to attack uh, capital ships where possible, uh, you know, leaving charges uh, in and around or under or attached to capital ships. Uh, the diver's main, one of his main tasks on that was uh, these big ships were guarded all the way around by a net that hung down, uh, to stop torpedoes or anything else actually getting there. So he would have to get out and there's a hydraulic cutter and he would cut a hole in the net so they could get the craft through to get access to the ship. And then he would get back in again. So it's uh, lots of tasks coming, evolving from this. Brilliant. So we've got a couple of questions coming. So Ian Carr is asking, is the chariot based on a torpedo or are, or are the internals fundamentally different? The, I, th I think it's more the, the torpedo shape. Right. Uh, because it's, a, you know, they've got to have a, a motor in there for a start. Uh, they've got to have batteries. Uh, so it, it's different to the torpedo, but it, it, they, they were referred to as human torpedoes but they were craft designed for that particular purpose. And of course it had a detachable warhead. Okay. So when Julio was on a year and a half ago, talking about the Italian dive, diving teams in World War II, what I remember about that is there was some dramatic successes of those divers in the Mediterranean and also some dramatic failures. Was the Royal Navy experiencing the same highs and lows or was, was the kind of arc of, of technology improvement slightly more steady for the Royal Navy? I think that uh, from all the research that I've done, uh, and I stand to be corrected, uh, we fared pretty well with our people. That they, they did lose divers for various reasons, but uh, not to the extent that the Italians did. Because the, the thing with the Italians was, as soon as uh, the chariots blew up the first ships and they sank, and they, you know, rationale was that something out there blew them up they had ships out there with depth charges hmm. so they would regularly go out there dump depth charges along uh exploding in uh in random formations uh and that did stop a lot of them because uh, or kill a lot of them because uh, you know they never knew when anybody was going to uh, a ship was going to come and go after them although you you didn't they didn't know they were down there because there was no bubbles coming up. You know, these guys were completely hidden. Mm. But it seems to me, whether you're Italian or British, the, the potential rewards of sending out a few human beings are massive. I mean, as you said, that if a capital ship can be sunk by effectively half a dozen guys, that is an incredible um, gain for a very small loss, even if the, the half a dozen people lost their lives. Uh, that would still be a huge gain. If you look at, again, comparing perhaps to commandos or, or SAS patrols or, or, or airborne forces, to get a similar gain, you'd have to send hundreds or maybe thousands of people in. So it seems to me that this technology, when it works, it, it, that the results are absolutely f uh, phenomenal. So are there any cases, that, uh, British examples that stand out to you of really, really incredible use of these, either the torpedoes, midget submarines or divers? Well, with with the torpedoes, they they went into Alexandria in North Africa, uh, and uh, put two capital ships out, uh, you know, and and that was just uh, uh, two or three uh, human torpedoes, because you don't necessarily have to sink the ship, you know, you can put it in the right uh, the warhead in the right place and put it out of action, and if it can't go to sea, it's not very effective. 
No, or or it's vulnerable to an air attack or something else. It's it's yeah. disabling it for someone else bigger to come in with a bigger punch. Is great stuff. So, so I, I, move on to the next slide. I know. I'm just going back to the X craft. Okay, sure. Uh, I worked uh, with who you, uh, a chap called Ian Fraser, Victoria Cross. He was the captain of one of the X craft, and they were in the Far East, and he parked the uh, uh, his, his his craft under a capital ship uh and then when he tried to pull it out once the mines were all in place he couldn't he couldn't get it out it was stuck in the mud and what he needed was the tide to come in and, and it, that which would lift it again and of course he's sitting there in his uh submarine uh, with all these charges that would blow him up as well as the ship he did manage to get it out because uh you know i spent time with him but he was a very sort of laid back character. You know, he, he was no, no fuss about it. You know, we, well, if it had gone bang, it went bang. So that would have been it. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose if it goes wrong down there, it goes wrong very badly, very quickly, I suppose. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, the, that's uh, I guess, a, a small comfort. We've got a question from Stuart Buxton. Did special forces divers play any special part in the Mediterranean theater operating from Malta, specifically from Malta? It doesn't flag up. Uh, Crab took his unit from um, took his unit from Gibraltar to Italy, so he was there as 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 the as the uh, Allies pushed up through Italy. He he followed up, and they were clearing mines in the port so they could bring ships in. And he actually got a lot of the Italian divers who, after the surrender, came came over and worked because they were now clearing their ports of their minds. So, you know, that was a big factor. Uh, Malta would have had divers there, but not uh, in a, what I would call a big theatre that I know of anyway. And that story you just mentioned there of, of the Italians who then became allies because of the 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 the, 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 the deal, that, that's an amazing thing because we just talked a few minutes ago about these rival technologies, you know, two years, a year early, they were, they were, they were enemies, they were trying yeah. to to um, kill each other, they're 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 bar looking at each other's technology. Now suddenly they're together now, working for the same cause to make Italy uh, safer. I bet as a diver, you'd have loved to have gone back and been a fly on a wall on some of those early conversations when these Italian and British divers sitting in the mess there discussing the the previous uh, uh, years of the war. That'd have been an amazing thing to be part of. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Speaking to Sid Nose, who I mentioned before. Yeah. Uh, one of his good friends, as it turned out, and he's kept touch with him for years, uh, was a chap called Walk, uh, and he was an Italian gamma swimmer. So he was coming across from Gibraltar, sticking mines on ship, uh, and uh, Sid was out there removing them. But they remained good friends after the war, or during the war, after the war. Uh, you know, it's the way it is. And, and divers are strange people like that as well. And, and that, that, you know, we're going to get to your your career in more modern times. But is there an international bond of I'm going to call them military divers? You know, they they say that paras. I mean, when in Normandy, for example, in June, when German paras meet meet American paras, meet British paras, meet French, Italian paras, whatever they would be, there's this camaraderie. They go drinking together. They swap their patches and wings and things like that. Is it the same for divers across the world? Yes. I would say so, yes. Yeah, uh, especially, to, well, more so perhaps today because we're integrating more with so many other nations. Yeah. But certainly back then, yeah. Yeah, and it's that sort of sh shared adversity. But we'll we'll move on to your next slide, which is lots of technical data there. So back to you. Yeah, I'm not going to go into the technical data. This is just uh, the top left one there is the uh, catalogue of diving equipment that was available to the uh, SOE, uh, you know, the Secret Operations Executive. <clears throat> so they had uh, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they had the early uh, diving uh, equipment, uh, uh, which they could open up, give the code, and they would get it delivered. Uh, there was a small submarine that was built called the Wellman, uh, and that would uh, take people in. The idea was you would, take in an agent, drop them off, and then you would get away. Then there was the Sleeping Beauty. That was a motorized canoe, and that could be dropped from an aeroplane or uh, from another boat. And you just drove it in, and the idea was that you went alongside uh, a ship. 
stuck your limpet mines on it and then got away again. Uh, not uh, not uh, operational during the war. I think it came too late, uh, but it was an experimental craft. Although speaking to the Americans, uh, they did uh, get some, and I think they used them, but there doesn't seem to be very much information. Mm. And there's lots of stuff in Australia. And we've done stuff about Z-Force down there, lots of stuff going on. We were talking about Fremantle a few weeks ago on the show, and, and that was a very, very popular place for experimenting with all sorts of underwater gadgetry, some of which saw operational use and some of it didn't. But I guess yeah. it's this idea of, the, of of a technology being in its infancy. They're still trying to work out what can be done, what can't be done, and coming yep. up with better and better ideas. And in that process, some of them, I suppose, work better than others. Um, yeah. yeah. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Okay, if we go to the, to the next yep. one. Okay, uh, I just looked at that one as transport, what was available to us then. Uh, Obviously, we've got the canoe uh, that came into to being, uh, and the uh, uh, they went up the River Garonde uh, to attack the ships at Bordeaux, uh, which actually, al although they only two of them survived from the uh, uh, the was it eight that went up, uh, they actually uh, the the Germans stopped using the port uh, because of risk of attack, so only two of them came home. Uh, Hasler, whose operation it was, he was one of them that came back. So, and that's still in use today. If uh, doing the research and being in touch with uh, special uh, forces divers all over the world, uh, they, they all talk about canoes <laughs> uh, and they carry them and they train with them. And you can fight from them. Uh, you can use a, a small mortar firing from one. Uh, just hope it, you know, you've got a sandbag in there to stop it from going through the bottom. But, and then of course the, we didn't have outboard motors. So you've got the uh, uh, paddling the, uh, the boat. Uh, and then the bottom one is paddling again uh, with wearing breathing apparatus. So you could paddle in uh, and they were going to be used uh, for the next phase. Really. Uh, if we go to the next slide, because it came up to, uh, if you're going to land in uh, northern France, uh, where you've got all these concrete bunkers and defences and it's going to be a hell of a, an operation, you need to clear the beaches because the Germans put all sorts of obstructions in the water right along that beach. Uh, so uh, to try and get a landing craft in, if you met something like the top uh, left picture there, yep. uh, you know, you're going to do damage to it. You're not going to get it close to the beach. They've got to be removed, and they've got to be removed quickly and efficiently and levelled. So, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, just a comment from Rob Crane about using a mortar from a canoe. He said the cop tried it, and apparently they went backwards when they fired it. I guess the trick was to anchor it first. Which is yeah, it, 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 it's, it, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've never actually tried it, but people say you can do it, and they use a sandbag on there and you sit on the sandbag uh, and it depends on the angle as well where it, the uh, back force is going to go but on this uh yeah you've got the uh, all these uh, steel works in the water all designed to stop landing craft uh, or anything else getting to the beach and so they they got all these divers in all these different units and trained them uh and it was a formidable task. And without these guys doing that work, uh, they couldn't have landed on those beaches. Uh, it was as simple as that. So before uh, D-Day, uh, they had to go in, swim in, uh, try and remain unseen uh, right on the surf area uh, and stick charges on. And now <clears throat> the, it all, <clears throat> they knew what the uh, 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 defences were and what they look like. Um, so shape charges were made. So you just go in there, slap a charge on it, and the detonator will go off in due course once you're clear of it. So they would go in and en masse go along, uh, stick in the, stick in the uh, explosives on there, which is shown in the picture below there, which yeah. is a drawing uh, of that sort of uh, environment. And then you've got the uh, in the swimming pool, practicing, working together, uh, and working as a team. Uh, and then uh, 
the sort of kit they were wearing is the one in the right uh, because they would also photograph what they could from the sea line so that the uh, they could uh, get get pictures of uh, of where they were going to land uh, so that the, these were the key elements to get in there and all these guys were volunteers uh, and they went in there uh, the they uh, had kapok um, jackets made uh, kapok being a good insulator uh, so if you were still in the water when uh, when uh, the charges went off uh, the KPOC uh, took absorbed the impact of the explosion, uh, and that was effective and 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 saved them. Uh, there's very few recorded, uh, probably a handful of, of divers that had a problem or were killed during that operation. Uh, and of course, they were <laughs> they could mark up the beach where the landing craft had to come in uh, and land. And of course, once they got those cleared uh the divers sat on the beach uh and waited for everybody to to bring their craft in and land and uh helped if or went dived again if they were required so this was a critical part of of uh the d-day landings and of course they were unseen unheard nobody really knows about them but it was a formidable task yeah brilliant stuff moving on yep We talked about the Italians. The Germans was, were very slow in taking up the diving, but they did from got that from the Italians. Uh, the guy on the right there, that's a German uh, in uh, the closed circuit system. Um, and what they did was they they, they went down. Uh, the, the plan was to go down the river uh, to the, uh, oh, dear, what's it, the... Uh, uh, Sorry, just quickly looking for it. That was the River Wall, and wow, that was yep. down to the I. Uh, goodness me, uh, Ny Nymagen. Nymagen. Sorry, yep. yeah, no sorry, blank spot there. Nymagen bridges uh, to slow down the Allied advance, uh, and so they they put these teams together and sent them off on this on this mission. And how they they did it? They were going to go down the river. Uh, they had uh, the first. Uh, group that would go down uh they were going to do the road bridge which was uh the next bridge down from the rail one they had two charges uh, and they would uh, they would swim down with them which they did and they managed to get them down there uh but very ineffective uh the four uh went down and the idea was you snagged those ropes around the the pillars and they did do some damage uh the uh, 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 the 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 exploded uh, and some of the bridge. Yeah, oh sorry, it's the road bridge that. Uh, right. Okay. The, the 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 rail bridge was wrecked, and then uh, the road bridge was uh, was was damaged. Um, so that was in effect uh, successful. They lost one one of their people was killed, one critically uh, injured, uh, and uh, the rest were captured. Uh, once they'd gone past the uh, uh, past the bridges, and they I just... think it's fair to say, Mike, that the people watching who would consider themselves Operation Market Garden experts, this is one part of the market garden story they didn't know before: German divers to slow down their advance. So you've you've caught out our viewers with a bit of a knowledge they didn't know. At least everyone is is not admitting they they didn't know it. So I certainly didn't know it until you told me. So yeah. amazing stuff. And they were, they, I mean, it was probably their, their their first and real task you know they they were and they were they were uh like most divers you know quite aggressive that it was going to happen and it was going to work uh and yeah the, it, it was it took some doing they actually entered the water where they actually entered the water into the river that was in german hands and then there was this sort of bulge around the bridge and then there was uh it was more German uh, held territory. So the idea was they went in in German occupied, swam down uh, the river, left the charges in place, uh, and they had to drag those things around on the bottom of the river, uh, all without being seen, uh, to get them where they wanted them uh, to, for best effect. They then swam on. Uh, they thought that they were in uh, 
in, in safe area in, in to, back in with the German lines, uh, but they weren't. So uh, in their escape a, a bid, uh, they were captured and uh, one was shot and, and then one was seriously wounded. So that was a, a, an insight into, you know, where they come from. Yeah. We just had a question from Sheldrake. It said, did this attack happen during Market Garden or after the operation was over? So is it just to confirm the, the dates for this, please? I haven't got the date to hand. Uh, I haven't got the date to hand on that. Sorry. Okay, no worries. But but at the time, the same bridges. So, okay, no worries. It's the same bridges, yeah. And uh, it, 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 I think everything it delayed. I mean, it just uh, stopped movement for a bit. And then I think we were quite effective at being able to bridge rivers at that stage. Okay, no problem. So we're, we're starting to get toward the, well, towards the end of the World War II aspect. But back to you for this slide. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, after the war, uh, <clears throat> the uh, the diving went into one one element, and that was the Royal Navy. So they took charge of, of diving. The Royal Marines uh, had their diving, which was uh, was separate, but that was for their special forces, and they beca they were then handed over to the Royal Marines, and that was the special boat service. So that was the two main elements. The uh, the army had the Royal Engineer divers. And they, you know, were again a separate element. But for the main part, uh, it was uh, the clearance divers. Uh, part of their equipment over the evolving years is is the uh, the picture on the left showing a, uh, a CD clearance diver uh, in in the dress uh, that I remember being in use, and uh, you know, in the dry suit. Uh, and a mask uh, they uh you when they use their diving equipment the the breathing hose went into the mask uh, and it had a, a, a teat inside and that went into the diver's mouth uh the sbs wanted a mask and a separate mouthpiece much the way as uh, you know a scuba diver would have mm. today uh because these guys kept the mask on for the duration whereas sbs would pop up and want to be able to move their mask and get rid of their breathing apparatus if they were coming into land somewhere. And then the bottom right is the uh, the standard job, uh, uh, a Marine there, come ashore, uh, and it's part of the, uh, uh, back in the time, uh, the getting the gradient of the, of the beach, you know, and, and taking samples from the beach because they, you know, we had to know whether that beach could take a tank or what else, you know, what other equipment was going to be landed. So they, that was the beginning. And, of course, the diving then, it all had formal courses. Divers had to go and have uh, medicals. You had to be fit to do the job. The course was standard. Everybody did the same course, uh, unlike during the war when medicals were, you know, <laughs> you're breathing, you're fine. Uh, this was a whole change in the concept of it. And then the teams took over various roles in with their diving capability. They'd be di di a lot of their work during the post-war period, of course, was dealing with the German mines that were floating around out at sea mm. uh, that got loose from their, their fittings, which are, are still out there to this very day. Yeah, well, I'm just going to come back to a question in a minute. But Sheldrake has is, is done a quick check. The attack was on the 28th of, December, of September, so very soon after the withdrawal of first airborne. But but uh, but yeah, in that time of, of the time. In that time, time garden, yeah. So there we are. So just going back to what you're saying about that that end of war period, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier in the in the top of the show is that I'm just <coughs> presuming there was never any doubt that there was going to be a need for divers post-war. In that, when we're talking about other special forces around the world, they're all being disbanded and collapsed. Merrill's Marauders, Rangers are fighting for their existence in the U.S. Paratroopers are are they going to be needed? SAS gets gets you know wound down. I, I, I assume in the case of the okay that they they get organised. The Royal Navy do what they do. Royal Marines commanders do what they do. But there was never any doubt that this was going to be something that would be needed in the future. Is that right? Certainly, especially for the clearance divers, yeah. you know, you've got mines. We have a mine sweeper that will go and sweep uh, mines. 
but what do you do with a mine that's washed up on a beach? So it's part in water, part out of water, or it might be seen uh, or it might be discovered in water and they need to put people in uh, to go and look at it and deal with it, find out what what mine it is. Uh, so, yeah, they they were needed and they, they, they were kept busy and they still are. Yeah. Which brings us to the last few slides there as we come into kind of your era and then beyond in that the, the basic principles, I suppose, stay the same in that it's clearing mines and there's an offensive uh, role as well. But the technology, I'm assuming, gets better and better and better. And the delivery, the speed with which the, you know, the, the paddle your own canoe era uh, with the outboard motor and things like that. So run us through the next the next part of your presentation, please. OK, if you. Oh, yes, yeah, so you have. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The uh, the top two, the first two, the top left and the one in the middle there, they're German. Uh, they uh, latched on to this very quickly after the war. Uh, they're swimmer delivery vehicles. Uh, so they're both, uh, you're exposed to water uh, in them. Uh, so they developed and designed and developed those for their units, which are quite, and this of course aids when you've got a, a people in the water where they might have to fin for a long distance. Uh, in, in this way, that gets you very close to your target. And, of course, you can carry uh, a little bit of equipment on board it, uh, you know, and it helps you along. Uh, so though there was those two. On the right, again, it's the delivery of the uh, canoes. Um, there, That's a Danish uh, setup there. Uh you get your canoes from inside the uh, submarine. You you sit on board them, wait. The submarine submerges, and away you paddle. Uh, the uh, bottom left is a unique craft. Uh, it it was I found this one uh, in the uh, first book in Combat Frogman, uh, and that's where one of these. You know that not that picture. It, that's been an up. That's the upgraded version. Uh, but this craft has been around for a long time. It's a, a, an inflatable, a semi-rigid inflatable uh, that actually you you suck the air out of the tubes, it sinks, and it becomes a submarine or a mini-sub. It's absolutely incredible piece of kit. And you can see at the, the bow and just at the stern there, there's the uh, uh, propellers for the, for the uh, port side and, and the same on the other side. And then when you go in, do you, what you have to do, your operation, and then you come back out uh, and uh, and away you go. That can carry six divers. Uh, so you can get a team in there. They can carry mines, do beach surveys, infiltrate a team, whatever's necessary. And then uh, you've got the submarine. Well, we've been able to lock in and out of submarines for a long time, but it's still used. Uh you know, even even up till today, uh, you know, the, the submarine comes up to a reasonable depth. You lock your people out. They go off and swim, uh, do what they have to do, uh, and then come back and they can lock back in again. So their developments, things that were going on throughout the years uh, to improve the lot of the diver, to get him closer to the beach without having to endure long distance swims. Brilliant. Which which brings us to, to more more options of training. This, this truly is James Bond stuff. It's come up in the sidebar there. You know, you wouldn't be uh, surprised if you saw Q explaining this to Sean Connery in a film. You know, this really is incredible kit that they they're, yeah. they're being issued. Well, the top left one. Uh, it's a shame. It's a small picture, uh, but that's a U. Their U.S. Navy SEALs uh, the, the, the covering their legs is their kit. They've got a, a, a breathing set a set above that, uh, and they've got a parachute uh, at high altitude, uh, and they're going to go out the back of that, uh, possibly have a, a, a boat with them. Uh, but if not, they'll, they'll just use that to, to swim into a beach. Uh, quite a dramatic picture, that one. Uh, and then the next one, uh, they're German, German divers uh, with a... Um, a little towing uh, craft, uh, and that will that will tow in two people, battery powered. Uh, and again, it stops the guys lots of uh, effort in, in long distance swimming. Although I have to say, uh, particularly the Americans, they do horrendous long distance uh, endurance swims as part of their training course. 
Uh, and then the right hand one uh, going out the back of a helicopter, he's got his fins on uh, and he's got his uh, sack with him, uh, which will be sealed and he can then drop into the sea and, uh, and, and swim. Uh, bottom left, uh, that's uh, Australian uh, Special Forces Navy uh, CDs, uh, and they'll power that boat in there at the appropriate time. The two guys on the bows wearing breathing apparatus just roll in. The boat speeds on and carries on going. Uh, and then uh, jet skis are used. Uh, I write about the uh, the Dutch operations uh, in off Somalia when they went in after pirates the the divers that attacked a dow dutch divers uh they were taken to the target by jet ski uh and then uh, they could the, the, the swimmers swam the last bit uh the, the jet ski cleared off out the way so as not to raise the alarm on the dow the guys went in planted their uh, explosives which put the uh, the dow out of action it was being used as a mothership for lots of smaller ones attacking merchant shipping. Uh, so, you know, they're in use. And then you've got the guy, uh, he's got his, uh, his load sealed and he's got his weapon on the top and he's just swimming in from something, a craft that's dropped him off. Uh, and then at the back end there, we've got, again, the inflatable boat with, with the divers sitting on it, uh, uh, checking all their equipment ready to go off out and do whatever operation it is they're going to do. Brilliant stuff. Okay. And, and, uh, was there always a sort of a sharing of ideas? Obviously, during the Cold War, there's the, and, and, and there are situations today where obviously we're not sharing with the enemy, but generally, like this idea of paratroopers being brother paratroopers, is there kind of a sharing of, 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 of information across the Allies all through the, the period you were involved in this? Uh, well, I I had uh, links into into uh, Holland with the Dutch Dutch Marines uh, who are in, in an integral part of our SBS. Right. Uh, you know they operate, train, and will go on on operations together. Uh, so yeah, that's long standing. Um, it's it's probably stronger now. There's more of a mix now than the, than there was. There's a lot more interchange with the various military forces. And one of the big developments, of course, has been the uh, dry deck shelter, uh, which takes the uh, bigger swimmer delivery vehicles. You, carry, uh, you can get six people on that. Uh, this is bolted on to a submarine and it connects into the submarine's uh, uh, um, hatches. Mm -hmm. uh, and the craft sits inside within the center. You, well, on the left, you can see it being yeah. uh, ready to go in. In the center, that's the uh, the crew, the dry deck shelter crew, who do the maneuvering of the craft in and out and make sure everybody gets in and, and everything is safe. <laughs> They're Royal Navy divers uh, uh, for us, and, of course, the Americans will have the same. Uh, the right-hand one just shows that's an American one there. But you've got a guy who's, uh, he will be on a, uh, connected to the submarine on, on, a, on a hose, and he will be guiding the uh, uh, the craft into the uh, the shelter. Uh, the bottom left is the, somebody waiting in there. And you can see, <coughs> excuse me, and you can then see the, uh, the guy in the center. You know, he's guiding the uh the craft going in uh, uh and then the, you've got the guy uh who has uh, come out from the hatch he's on he's on a hose he's on a a, a, a supply of uh breathing mix from the submarine itself so uh any cylinders he's got a, a backup uh so there the uh, that this has transformed everything that goes on uh these can go out there and of course, the divers, uh, they, when they go in these uh, craft, that, that one there uh, the, on the top left, they're sitting in water. It, it, they're open, exposed to water. Depth is critical, uh, and duration of the dive is critical. Uh, but it's very, very controlled. The supervisor of the dive is in the craft, uh, who will be managing what's happening and going on out there. 
uh, yeah, very very effective. And of course, once it's back into the uh, into the ch into the deck shelter, uh, they can then pump all the water out, and the guys are back into atmosphere dry, same mm -hmm. as it's inside the submarine. So then they can go down and back in the submarine for food or whatever. But what's amazing is having just been talking about the X-Craft and the midgets, you know, the torpedoes earlier, is you can see the direct connections. You can see the evolution. You know, it's, it, okay, this is better and, and more sophisticated, but you can see the direct ancestry of, the, the, of this type of gadgetry, which brings us to the next photo, which, again, of the frogmen and the divers, is that, you know, so much of it is from the same as crabs there, you know, uh, rubber suit, mask, hose, yep. air coming in, and a weapon. That it, it, in some ways, although it, you know the, the principles are exactly the same as they were eighty years ago. Yep, and I mean here is a is, is a classic example. Uh, top left, uh, uh, the the army, U.S. Army, uh, combat divers. Uh, the middle photo, Philippines. Uh, the uh, the right is uh, Ukrainian special forces. The bottom left, Russian. And uh, the the bottom uh, centre one, uh, that's a um, British uh, setup, and that equipment is provided to the Royal Navy today from the particular company. And again, the one on the right supply, supplies uh, made in this country, and it supplies uh, equipment to various navies around the world. So we we are in there, and we are at the forefront of a lot of what's going on. Well, and but there and there are your two books: the one that, that's out now, and the older one, Combat, Combat from from eighty nine. But my last question is going to be something we were talking about before we went live, and that's you know the, the fact that when we're talking on this channel about some of the wartime special forces, as we said earlier, they may not be needed again. But when in your era, they were already thinking about replacing you with rovers and stuff like that we've all seen titanic with james cameron and stuff like that as far as you're concerned they, we're going to need divers for the foreseeable future is that correct yes certainly there are things that machines can do and they do a lot uh, but there are things that you do need the uh, the human element to go down there and as i say if if anybody that's, that's watching or listening uh, wants to know you know what does all this kit look like in real life you can go to portsmouth there's got a superb diving museum down there go and see that and uh yeah they'll uh, they'll look after you brilliant well we will we will end things there mike and it's it's great that you are an ambassador for this technology and taking us through you know 80 plus years of diving technology at which in some ways we can be impressed by the improvements of technology but as i say there's also echoes of it not being fundamentally different from those days off Gibraltar in 41 yep. and 42. It's, it's amazing stuff. So, folks, there is the book there, Combat Divers. I recommend it. It's got lots more information than we went into today. And uh, I will I, I will wish you well with the book, Mike. And, folks, we, you will, I will see you next week for our first Tank Destroyers Week. I haven't put all the information up yet about the shows, but I will do it over the weekend. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much for everybody for watching. And have a great, week, great weekend. This is Paul Woodhouse for World War II TV saying thank you for your attention. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.